This is our simulated dome tweeter setup. Uh, we're using two flashlights with a variable uh, focus, and they both have convex lenses on the front, which simulates the shape of a dome tweeter. We're using light here to simulate the audio waveform. As you know, light is a wave, audio is a wave. They're just at different frequencies, but it gives us a pretty good idea of the shape of the sound field that's being emanated by both the dome and the horn. Okay, let's take a look and see what happens when we use a dome tweeter. The uh, speaker on the left has a simulated dome tweeter beaming light instead of sound. It's got a convex piece of glass in the front of the flashlight simulating the shape of a dome. As you can see, it's a round dispersion pattern. Um, there's no real restriction from top, top to bottom. Um, side to side, there is some. Let's take a look and see what happens when we turn on the light for the horn. Now you can see the horn. The difference between the dome and a horn is that the dome is more diffuse around the edges. It's got, uh, it goes a lot higher and a lot lower down. And it's not as delineated and not as sharp as what the horn does. So that's the difference between a horn lens and a dome tweeter. And uh, as the sound stage goes out from a dome, it spreads out further and further. Same thing with a horn, but it keeps its same rectangular shape. This is what the audio slash video image would be looking like if sound were a light beam. As it comes out of the horn, it's defined by a distinct boundary where the horn confines the sound, so to speak. Um, in this case, it's uh, 90 degrees in width and 60 degrees in height. Every horn has a slightly different pattern, but most of them fall anywhere from 45 to 160 to 90 in their width. This totally delineates the sound stage and keeps it essentially encapsulated so it doesn't bounce off the walls, the ceilings, and the floors. You've got a focused lens-like audio quality to this where the instruments and the singers etc are placed exactly on the sound stage exactly as the engineer desires okay let's take a look at what a stereo image would look like with two dome tweeters as you can see the boundaries to the right and left are a bit fuzzier they're taller obviously and uh but the center image is quite large so that would represent the center image of a uh, audio recording now you can obviously tow the speakers out to kind of straighten that a little bit and make it narrower you can do that so there you go with that but it's it's not straight up and down it is somewhat distorted in its shape so when you're looking at a stereo image of, a, say, a singer, not looking, listening, actually, to a singer, you're going to have a bit of a distortion in that image. So the left piano or drums, for example, and the right piano or drums are going to be more diffuse, not as sharply focused as that of a horn, which acts as a lens. And so let's go ahead and light up the left speaker. As you can see, there's a distinct image there off to the left. And let's see what happens when we illuminate the right speaker. There's our stereo image in widescreen. The center white stripe in the center would be where the singer would be or the microphone would be or the whatever central instrument they're going to place. Obviously, on the left and right, it's going to be the other instruments, banjo, drums, etc., piano. So that's how it looks with two horns with controlled dispersion. You'll notice there's virtually no sound, a.k.a. light, emanating above and below, which means it's not bouncing off the ceiling, it's not bouncing off the floor. And the sides also, as I can show you here, are also controlled. There you have it. That's what happens in a stereo image with horns.
let's start by looking at the anatomy of a compression driver and a conventional tweeter. We'll start with the tweeter. This is a peerless by Tiffany ring radiator tweeter. It's a decent tweeter. It's used in a lot of products. So let's take a look at how this baby's put together here. This is a face plate. It's glued on plastic. This is the face of the diaphragm here where it connects to the magnet assembly. This is called a phase plug. It helps to delineate the high frequencies, helps direct them a little bit. That's what we call the voice coil. It's made out of very, very fine wire. This is an eight ohm model. The electrical energy comes through the magnet assembly here. And this voice coil fits in a slot. This slot moves this coil here in and out or back and forth. This plastic piece here goes through the hole in the center and helps keep it centered. This is the magnet assembly. It's a double magnet. It's decently heavy. Let's take a look at an older Bema CP380M compression driver. This driver was used, as far as I can determine, in some of the Avant Garde three horn speaker systems, and maybe the two horn as well. Those sold for upwards of around $30,000. So uh, they use this for their high frequency driver. It's still being produced by Bema. It's well thought of. This is the back plate here we're going to remove. It's pretty heavy, made out of aluminum. There is a piece of foam on the inside to absorb the back wave from the diaphragm. Now, just as a point of comparison, this is the diaphragm from a one inch ring radiator tweeter. This is the diaphragm from a one inch mouth. I think it's around almost a two inch polymer diaphragm here. The diaphragm is made out of polymer, which absorbs some of the reflections and kind of damps the uh, driver down a little bit so it's not quite as harsh as, say, a titanium driver. Um, these are the electrical connections. We're going to lift this off of here. That's the voice coil assembly. Here is the voice coil assembly for a conventional ring radiator tweeter. That's the voice coil assembly for a compression driver, a one inch. They call it a one inch because it interfaces with the mouth, one inch mouth of the horn. So we're going to set that aside here. This is the compression chamber for want of a better term. This polymer diaphragm fires down into this compression chamber here. The air is squeezed through these slots, hence the fact that it's a compression driver. The sound waves are compressed, squeezed together. This gives us a huge increase in efficiency and detail retrieval because when those sound frequencies come out of this opening, which is a one inch opening, and through this horn here, they couple like this essentially, um, it allows the sound waves that are moving at a highly compressed state. The air is compressed more so than the air around us. When it comes out of the horn, that compressed air is brought essentially down to the pressure of the atmosphere and the interaction between this and this is complete in that the interface that now is between normal air pressure and compression, which is decompressed in the horn. Now we'll touch on this a little bit later, but they always say, oh, they have said in the past, not so much now, that uh, horns are honky, horns are distorted, horns can sound kind of odd and uneven in their frequency response. That used to be true. It's completely changed with uh, laser analysis of horns and their design. You'll notice that there is a kind of a, a bend here and a taper a gradual taper outwards of the horn. That means that the reflections are mitigated. In other words, they aren't as strong as they would normally be. 
the interface between the open air and the horn is complete here when it exits the horn driver. So you can see here, there are huge differences in the magnet structure, the diaphragm, and the magnet size in this two comparisons here. Tweeter, compression driver. In summary, the reason we chose horns as our primary high frequency driver is because we originally went with a high air motion transformer. You're probably familiar with that. Um, we wanted something completely different to be used on our speakers, something that provided a unique sonic experience. Unfortunately, after about a year of using it, it was unobtainable. Not quite sure why. So we tried a couple different things. We tried using ribbons, a raven whip ribbon, which is considered to be a pretty good ribbon. Uh, it was detailed. It was smooth, but it was lackluster in its dynamics. It just left us feeling flat. So from there, we took a look at horns. We took a look at horns because we had heard good and bad things about them. Uh, the bad things were they, people say they sound honky. They're harsh. They're up in your face. Well, none of those things are true with modern horn designs. With the new geometry of the horn flare, they're computer designed. They're designed not to sound honky. Uh, the dispersion is well controlled. You don't have all that bounce off the walls and ceiling that you get from a normal tweeter like this here. Um, uh, as far as power, they can handle just about anything you throw at them. Uh, they're very, very detailed because of the compression they provide, as we went over before in the earlier part of the video. So we tried them. We liked them. We've stayed with them ever since. Um, basically, if you're going with a tweeter in a speaker, that's fine. Um, more power to you. But the issue is there's a lot of speakers on the used market. And why is that, in our opinion? It's because they all use the same technology mostly, and that's conventional tweeters. So you're doing you trade to this one, you use this one instead, you sell it, you buy another one. Until you get away from this conventional type of driver, you probably will never be satisfied with the dynamics and detail that a horn speaker can provide you. So try our speakers. I'm sure you'll like them. I appreciate the attention to our video and uh, thank you very much.